The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Making Sense of New Standards for CLL, Pharmacist Insights on Targeted Therapy and the Delivery of Team-Based Care. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash AFW860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello, and welcome to Making Sense of New Standards for CLL. I'm Dr. Amber King, a clinical pharmacy specialist from the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in the Leukemia Department. Today, I'm going to review the science that has validated targeted agent classes and transformed how we manage CLL. Throughout, we'll focus on the role of pharmacists in delivering the benefits of modern, effective treatment with BTK and BCL2 inhibitors to patients suffering from CLL. During this program, I will periodically share several resources that can inform evidence-based dosing, monitoring for drug interactions, and safety management with targeted therapy. So please take a moment to download these practical tools before we get started. Let's begin. Over the years, we've had a flurry of new developments in CLL, led by the targeted and novel targeted therapy, Ibrutinib, our first BTK inhibitor. Throughout this slide, you'll see varying degrees of phase three evidence for brutinib compared against the previous standard of therapy and shown to improve both progression-free and overall survival in various groups of patients, followed by newer generations of BTK inhibitors, such as acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib. Additionally, another class of medications that made huge breakthroughs in CLL was the BCL2 inhibitor, venetoclax. In particular, venetoclax combinations with CD20 agents have proven superior to previous standard cares of therapy and offer a time-definitive therapy for certain patients. In terms of what we have so far in terms of FDA approvals and agents that are close to FDA approval for CLL, we have the BTK inhibitors, including a brutinib and a calibrutinib, which are FDA labeled and approved for both CLL slash SLL, Xanabrutinib, which is currently in phase three studies, and pirabrutinib, which will be our first non-covalent binding BTK inhibitor, also in late phase three studies. Venoclax is our first and only currently approved BCL2 inhibitor for CLL and SLL. The PI3K inhibitors are noted overall the varying toxicity profiles, including opportunistic infections and immune-related colitis, have really reduced their use in practice. Of note, Umbrellacid, the recent phase three trial, was placed on a clinical hold by the FDA for concern of events. Overall, we have a bevy of novel agents, some of different drug classes, yet we can still have issues delivering safe and effective care to our CLL patients in the real world setting. The following study overall notes that several barriers that occur in the actual clinic space, as opposed to a clinical trial, note toxicity, drug interactions, and discontinuations can lead to patients progressing or having refractory disease or overall succumbing to financial toxicity. Finally, access to these medications or even guidelines may not be readily available for some physicians, and thus patients may not exactly be optimized at the appropriate times. So here we'll talk about some tools for pharmacists. We're in a unique position to offer some specialized care whether you're practicing in a specialty pharmacy or part of a multidisciplinary team in an academic center, we can play an integral role in addressing dosing, safety, and overall coordination of care for our CLL patients. In terms of pharmacokinetic considerations with our targeted therapies, we have a few tables that are also available for download for your reference. Here, we'll look at pharmacokinetic considerations of these targeted therapies. These are focusing on our BTK inhibitors. Again, a brutinib and a calibrutinib are currently FDA approved for CLL slash SLL, and xenobrutinib is currently in late phase three studies. A brutinib has a relatively short half-life of four to six hours, and like most tyrosine kinase inhibitors, is metabolized through the 3A4 pathway and minorly through the 2D6 pathway. In terms of adjustment for organ dysfunction, a benefit of a brutinib and other BTK inhibitors is that there's no adjustment for renal impairment, which we may often see in our elderly populations, and they offer safe and efficacious adjustments for hepatic dysfunction. In this table, you will see pharmacokinetic considerations with targeted therapies in CLL, focusing on the BCL2 inhibitor, venetoclax. You see it has a longer half-life of about a day. Metabolism and transport is similar to the BTK inhibitors, 
Except here, we also have to consider P glycoprotein, which is a minor transport mechanism for venetoclax. As far as adjustments for organ dysfunction, there are no adjustments needed for renal dysfunction, but if your patient has renal impairment, you want to exercise extra caution, maybe admit them for their first week and second week of ramp up because they're generally at increased risk of TLS, including hyperuricemia, hyperphosphatemia. In terms of dosing for hepatic dysfunction, for child PU A and B, there are no recommended adjustments, but if your patient meets criteria for child PU C, we should cut the vanaclax dose by at least 50% and employ really careful monitoring to make sure there's no excess myelosuppression or GI toxicity. We'll have the PI3K inhibitors for your reference, but again, their place in CLL therapy is unclear. In terms of dosing and uh, formal drug-drug interactions with these targeted agents, there's a lot of detail here in consideration. Fortunately, over the years, especially with the brutinate looting in the forefront, many different formulations and studies have been demonstrated to have us safely use a lot of concomitant medications for our patients. In terms of abrutinib, we have several different tablet and capsule sizes, which allows us to adjust for both strong and moderate inhibitors. If you're looking at inducers of 3A4, it's really not feasible to adjust for this compensation. You have such a decrease in concentration that we really risk suboptimal efficacy. And so 3A4 inducers should really be avoided. Fortunately, abrutinib does not go through PGP or has gastric acid reducing contingencies. Acalabrutinib has similar dose adjustments where your standard dose is 100 milligrams twice daily, but in the setting of inhibition, notably moderate 3A4 inhibitors, your dose goes down by 50% to 100 milligrams once daily. Unlike the other BTK inhibitors, acalabrutinib actually does have an adjustment if you do have to have a patient on a moderate or strong 3A4 inducer, this time increasing the dose to compensate for the loss of concentrations to 200 milligrams twice daily. But again, overall, it's best to avoid this drug class unless absolutely necessary. One special note about acalabrutinib, which we'll get into later, is that currently the capsule dosage form succumbs to acid changes. And so there's recommendations to completely avoid long-term acid suppression with proton pump inhibitors as you have a significant decrease in concentration, thus reducing efficacy. Finally, xenobrutinib currently studied at two different doses, but labeled for 160 twice a day in other lymphomas, again, has similar adjustments for strong inhibitors and moderate inhibitors, but should be avoided with 3A4 inducers. Fortunately, this does not have the same acid contingencies as acalabrutinib. In terms of formulations that are being developed, an exciting one is a new formulation of acalabrutinib that's thought to be bioequivalent. And you can have a patient who needs a proton pump inhibitor or other long-term acid suppression without concern and loss of efficacy. So overall right now, the acalabrutinib capsules do not survive an overly non-acidic environment. And so it's unavoidable to time and space PPIs with acalabrutinib without a reduction in efficacy and drug concentration. Some new data coming out from ASH notes that a new malleate salt, an immediate release film coated tablet, and even a suspension for those patients that may have issues tolerating PO tablets or even capsules, notes that this suspension or tablet is safe and well tolerated even in the setting of acid reduction with a PPI. So this will be a novel development and really help some patients that otherwise need to have gastric suppression be maintained safe on acalabrutinib. In terms of more drug dosing interactions, again, these charts are all available for download. We look at our BCL2 inhibitor venetoclax. Of particular concern here is that, especially during the ramp up phase, we need to be extremely careful of what concomitant medications herbals, and supplements a patient is using during this ramp-up period as it could put them at excess risk for extremely severe tumor lysis syndrome that may land them in the hospital. In terms of the standard dose, without any major interactions, your dose is 400 milligrams daily once the patient completes the ramp-up period. Overall, strong 3A4 inhibitors cannot be used during the ramp-up phase. When a person safely at their 400 milligram target dose without any issues of electrolyte derangements or other concerns, then the patient can be decreased to 100 milligrams once daily, usually two or three days after the inhibitor is added. Moderate inhibitors can be used during the ramp up at a 50% dose reduction. And once you reach the venoclax target dose, the dose is 200 milligrams once a day. Again, similar themes to the most of the BTK inhibitors, except the calibrutinib, 
Venoclax should not be used with moderate or strong 3 or 4 inducers. If you have a concomitant PGP inhibitor, a popular one is carvedilol used for blood pressure and other heart conditions, you have to reduce the venoclax dose by 50% or 200 milligrams once daily once you get to the target dose. Fortunately, venoclax does not succumb to any meaningful reduction in concentration with a concomitant gastric acid reducing agent. In terms of why there's so many different agents and how there's a lot of selection based on what you can use and when, it's very tailored to patients because of varying off-target toxicities. So starting with the brutinib, the next generation of BTK inhibitors, especially calibrutinib and zenobrutinib, were designed to have less off-target effects, notably less bleeding, notably less AFib. And the non-covalent BTK inhibitor not only has less off-target effects, but can overcome some of the point resistance mutations we may see with our covalent BTK inhibitors. In terms of BTK inhibitor toxicity and safety principles, this is not only a kinetic profile, but also has been proven in clinical trials across many different studies. We'll focus on atrial fibrillation for now. AFib is reduced with the more selective BTK inhibitors, acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib, when compared to abrutinib. In addition, bleeding risk tends to go down, as does hypertension. GI side effects tend to go down as you go into a next generation of BTK inhibitors, overall reduced from the classic abrutinib. Furthermore, in terms of more dermatologic side effects and arthralgias, we tend to see lower rates with the newer generations of BTK inhibitors, acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib. Though they're not non-existent, the next generation of BTK inhibitors tends to be less severe in terms of dermatologic side effects, but maybe pertains and sustains the arthralgia. Infection risk is overall generally the same, particularly xanabrutinib has concerns for neutropenia, in terms of headache, acalabrutinib tends to be leading the pack in terms of side effects, especially severe side effects. And again, neutropenia tends to be the most severe with the current dosing forms of xanabrutinib. Overall principles for pharmacists, really monitoring for these side effects as they're going to be chronic, as these patients tend to be on the medication until an intolerable side effect or progression or relapse, really looking to make sure that they're optimized in terms of hypertension, any pain control with arthralgias, which can be self-limiting during the person's initial weeks or months on the medication. But it's really important to help these patients maintain and persist through to avoid resistance and also avoid progression. BCL2 inhibition also offers an, a different safety profile. There's risk of tumor lysis syndrome, particularly during the ramp-up phase where it's very important to make sure patients are compliant with xanthine oxidase inhibitors such as allopurinol or febuxostat, have either adequate oral or IV hydration for certain select patients, and appropriately are staged before they start to ensure that they don't have to be inpatient during their week one and week two of the dose escalation. Additionally, BCL2 inhibition does offer some myelosuppression. So it's very important to make sure patients come in intermittently for CVCs with differential, and also consider appropriate prophylaxis and even growth factor if needed, depending on where they are in their treatment. As a consequence of this myelosuppression, we can see infections. And so if patients have severe infections, particularly those that end up, have them end up in the hospital, it's important to withhold treatment, consider growth factors and supportive antibiotics. And once safe, usually reduced to grade one or less, we can rechallenge at perhaps a reduced dose level. Finally, GI effects tend to be more moderate when compared to ibrutinib and other BTK inhibitors, but we can still see some diarrhea, which of course infectious causes should be ruled out and treated conservatively with antidiarrheals and hydration, as well as nausea. And appropriate antiemetics can be used before or afterwards to prevent emesis. In terms of boiling all of these points down, there's a few scenarios here that you might see in clinical practice. While well, I'll offer my opinion based on my hospital's practice style, and what I know about the patients in these particular scenarios. The first one is a 70-year-old patient with treatment-naive CLL, high-risk, unmutated IGHV with comorbid renal dysfunction. In terms of your particular role in this patient's care, the first thing is to carefully review medications, making sure you hit on any supplements or herbals that the patient might take because they also can have interactions with the future therapy because a lot of these herbals and supplements actually have 3A4 PJP, or even antiplatelet activity. You want to ensure that the appropriate xanthine oxidase inhibitor is started usually two to three days prior any therapy to avoid hyperuricemia as part of tumor lysis syndrome. 
And in terms of the safest therapy based on evidence, you can consider a BTK inhibitor versus a cautious trial of netoclax and a CD20 due to the renal dysfunction that may put the patient at a higher risk for tumor lysis syndrome and severe hyperuricemia. The second scenario is a 70-year-old patient with treatment-naive CLL, also with high-risk features on mutated IGHV, but this time he has cardiac comorbidities, history of AFib. Overall, essential to review medications, patients with AFib may be on calcium channel blockers that may have inhibition properties that will increase concentrations of your tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Also, they may be on anticoagulants, which would be a concern, especially if you're using a brutinib, the older BTK inhibitor with the higher bleeding risk. And again, a lot of herbals have antiplatelet activities and 3A4 inhibition that will also put your patient at risk for higher drug concentrations and side effects. Again, you want to ensure that appropriate xanthine oxidase inhibition is started at least two to three days prior to therapy. And considering the history of AFib, you want to consider maybe the newer BTK inhibitors that have demonstrated a lower risk of atrial fibrillation when compared to a brutinib after coordination with a cardiologist or ideally a cardiac oncologist to address any anticoagulation needs and rhythm control or weight control strategies. Or perhaps a safer alternative considering the AFib may be BCL2 inhibitor plus CD20 therapy that would avoid the risk of exacerbating AFib overall. The final scenario is a younger patient with otherwise good risk with mutated IG, IGHV, good performance status, and no known comorbid illness. This is the few patient population where chemoimmunotherapy with FCR or fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, and rituximab may be still appropriate. Again, there's a risk of secondary malignancies with fludarabine or other purine analogs, so that should be thoroughly discussed with the patient. Additionally, there's emerging data that suggests time genitive therapy for younger patients may also be a decent approach that may avoid the risk of secondary malignancies and other toxicities. In terms of regimens that were selected for the patients, our first patient, the 70-year-old patient with high-risk CLL and comorbid renal dysfunction, ends up starting a brutinib and experiences pain for arthralgia. If you're seeing this patient in clinic or he calls you at your specialty pharmacy, again, important to make sure that there's no new medications that could be increasing his concentrations of a brutinib, no medications or supplements or herbals. That'll be the first step to remove that agent and seeing if the lower drug concentrations would lead to less side effects. As far as supportive management, assuring that his hepatic function is okay and otherwise no contraindications, you can consider over-the-counter analgesics such as acetaminophen or topical NSAIDs such as diclofenac. You really want to avoid oral NSAIDs in elderly patients with renal issues. Overall, if the aforementioned methods don't work, you can consider a short course of low-dose steroids and or a holiday of ibrutinib. Perhaps whenever this resolves to grade one, we can re-challenge at a lower dose level. For our second scenario, our 70-year-old patient with treatment-naive CLL with unmutated IGHV and cardiac comorbidities, which is a history of AFib, they end up starting a calibrutinib and develop headaches, a not uncommon side effect of a calibrutinib after three weeks of therapy. Again, you want to ensure that we can power these patients through the therapy to ensure that they get the optimal response. You want to make sure that there's no medications or supplements that are increase, increasing the calibrutinib concentrations. And you can certainly consider caffeine, either dietary or cautious use of acetaminophen with combination butabletol and caffeine, in addition to encouraging hydration. If this method doesn't resolve the headaches, and if they're severe and persistent, you may want to consider calling in help from neurology, either holding a calibrutinib or at worst case scenario, an alternative BTK inhibitor or even BCL2-based therapy. And finally, our 57-year-old patient with treatment-naive CLL, mutated IGHV, no comorbid illness, and good performance status, ends up going with Venoclax obinutuzumab ramp up for a time-definitive approach, but is confused over the schedule. I think Venoclax in particular can be very confusing, but fortunately, the packaging is very intuitive. And so the best scenario is, if possible, sit down and open the box and review with the patient really match up the colors based on the weeks and when he or she has to come back into clinic, also encouraging an aggressive oral hydration schedule. I always advise patients to bring the drug with them, but don't take to clinic just to make sure that the labs that come back aren't aberrant. And that concludes our exploration of targeted therapy and CLL from the pharmacist's perspective.
I hope you found this activity informative and useful for your practice. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash AFW 860. This activity is supported by an independent educational grant from AstraZeneca.